I got to spend a week, Joy and I did, with our granddaughter, Emery, who is almost two. She'll be two on December the 13th. And I try not to talk too much about her, but I just sometimes have to, and this is one of those times. So if you're not a grandparent yet, and you're gonna be at one point, and you think you'll never talk about your grandkids, you won't be one of those kind of grandparents, you will be, or there's something wrong with you. If you're a grandparent, you know what I mean. They're so much better than kids. I mean, like 10 times better than kids. And not only that, but I have a, a, a granddaughter, and I raised two boys, Joy and I did, and um, little girls are just so much more advanced. They're so much smarter. They're just so much more fun to, to be around. And um, they're thinking all the time. My boys were just simple. You look at them at two years old, you knew exactly what they were thinking. There was no question about it with Emery. She's got imagination. She's got these schemes and things that are going on. And she's got a strong will, which her mom was working on that. I don't have to because I'm grandpa. And I got to spend three different days with her where I was solo where it was just Emery and me. Joy had to do other things. Her mama was working. You know, of course, my son Richard's working. And Emery and I got to spend most of the day together. And I, I won't lie to you, I was a little bit freaked out at first by that because, you know, she's two and there's lots of responsibility in keeping her alive and fed and making sure the car seat's strapped in the right way and, you know, everything goes the way it's supposed to. And, and um, the first day was kind of a it was a good day. We had fun together, but it was kind of a disaster because everything hinges in a two-year-old's life around three things. One of them is the bathroom. It's pooping and potty training. And number two is, um, well, that's number two, isn't it? But the other one, I'm sorry, that was bad. The, uh, the other one is nap time. That's really, really important, right? Uh, nap time, because if you don't get a nap, the world stops when you're with a two-year-old. And then the third one is making sure that they're fed because when they're fed, they're happy and they only eat certain things around certain people, I found out. So with Emery and I, um, we have this arrangement. Uh, I can watch her. I'm happy to watch her. We hang out. We wa I watched Frozen for like, I mean, I was a conscientious objector to Frozen for years and years and years. And now I've watched the whole thing through. And I'm not better for it, but I am more informed. And um, that was one of the things we did together. And, you know, the, I don't do diapers, though. I've shared that with you before. I did plenty of diapers when my kids were young. Boy, I changed so many diapers. And once my boys got out of diapers, I said, praise God, I'm delivered from diapers, never going to change a diaper again. And I have not. It's not that if there was an emergency, if we were stuck way out in the middle of the desert, it was just the two of us and she had a diaper. What I, of course I would, but we're not. And I don't, and I haven't. And that's the way that it works out. Her mama only works three minutes from the house which is wonderful because when Emery has a, a diaper, I just pick her up and put her in the car seat, drive her up to Eden's work and carry her in by the armpits and go here. And she changes her and she, I take her right back home and we hang out and it's perfect. It's just the way that it is. I have my other son's girlfriend who's five minutes away. Eden, her mama's three minutes away. Joy's never far. There's always somebody ready to change a diaper, but we're working on the potty training. I'm not, they are. And I think it's funny because it's a really important thing when you're two. And um, Emery has this uh, little toilet. And um, if you're uh, on the big boy toilet, you are looking at this little toilet and her little setup, um, which I just wanted to take a picture of for you and show you, because it's just amazing. They didn't have resources like this when I was a kid. It's this tiny little knee-high toilet and it has this massive, I was playing with it, so I know. It has this massive flushing sound that's battery operated and you flush it and it goes whoosh. I mean, like the, it's flushing the world down the toilet and it's so much, so satisfying to flush that. But if you notice the book that's next to it, the book is really important. And I actually read this book because I had some time. It says, what do you do when you go poo? I know it's church and everything, but for a two-year-old, remember it's, right? Potty training, nap time, food. That's, that's, and then frozen. That's like a fourth place. I read that book and um, it's a pretty good book. And, you know, I realized my mom didn't have those resources when I was two and she just figured, uh, you know, it would all work itself out. Everything would be fine. But if you read this, there's some good fundamentals in there. So I recommend you may order this book. It's on Amazon. The church does not get any kind of monetary compensation if you order, but take a look at it. If you got a two-year-old, you know, you never know. They train kids differently now. They have instruction manuals on things. And sometimes it's good for us to go back to the basics. And today that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to the basics. We're going to be talking about communion, the Lord's Supper. And we're going to talk about one of the most basic truths in all of the Bible, but one that we often overlook. We're going to go right back to the things that are really important when we get started. 
I want to talk to you today about the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And then in the second half of our time together, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper by participating in that together. Now, don't get um, frustrated or disillusioned or bored when I say the word covenant, because that's not boring, disillusioning, or frustrating. The word covenant literally means agreement. And what we're going to be talking about is a new agreement that God made with us, with people. And it was initiated, instigated at this last supper and completed just a few days later when Jesus was arrested, crucified, buried, and when he rose again. And so we're gonna talk about that today, but let me read it first as we get started. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover, which used to be a celebration of the Jews leaving Israel, or, um, Egypt in their exodus, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God, until the things you're going to see me do over the next few days are done. So the meal we've always eaten together to follow Old Testament law that commemorates the exodus from Egypt the thing we've always done together, we're no longer going to do together in the same way. That this same meal is going to be different forever and it's going to be changed over the things you're gonna see me do in these next few days. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new agreement, the new way that God was gonna relate to us in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now the old covenant was all about a sacrificial system, a religious system that required a lot of dues, a lot of, effort and the reality that you could never quite be good enough to meet and fulfill the requirements that God had. It was given to humanity to frustrate, particularly the children of Israel, to the point where they knew that they could not achieve righteousness themselves and that they had to look to someone else to come and bridge this gap. It was based on blood sacrifices and temporary atonement and appeasement. And the relationship that God had with Israel in the old covenant was really important. You ready to listen? This is really important. Really, really important and might clear up some confusion that some of you have. Because a lot of pastors blur the lines here and I think forge God's name on promises and things that you may have been told that God really wasn't intending for you or for me in the first place. The Old Testament, the covenant that God made the children of Israel knew that God was present in their lives or in their people by their circumstance. If their circumstances were good, God was present. They were right with God. If they disobeyed God, their circumstances were bad and they knew they had to do something different. Does that make sense? Bad circumstances, somebody had blown it. One of their leaders had disobeyed God. Something had happened. They were separate from God. Their circumstances in life were difficult. And then if they were right with God, their circumstances, well, they were really, really good as a people. And so we look sometimes to old covenant promises that were made in the Old Testament and try to apply them to our lives today. And we get very, very confused because a lot of the promises in the Old Testament, in the old covenant were made from God to the children of Israel as a people group at a particular time and place and for a particular purpose. And sometimes because Christians love to put a bow on life and circumstance and make everything rosy and happy, we take some of the promises that were never intended for us and try to conform or force them into our lives under the new covenant. And we grow frustrated with God and begin to look at our lives the same way they did, which is if our lives are going well, then God is present. And if our lives aren't going well, then God must be absent. And the new covenant, God's presence in our lives is not based on circumstance. It's based on a person, an event, 
a work of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And implied and soon experienced was the Holy Spirit indwelling the life of a believer so that we could have these things that God did promise in the New Testament that so many of us overlook. So what are you talking about, pastor? What I'm saying is, is that the new covenant is better because it's for us. And what I'm saying is that just because sometimes your life doesn't look better or feel better, it doesn't mean that God's not with you, that he's not present, that he's abandoned you, or that you should have a crisis of faith. I was thinking about a story in the New Testament about Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Um, anybody have a, a cousin that you're gonna see maybe over Thanksgiving or Christmas? Anybody have cousins in here? Cousins, they vary. No one has a cousin in here? Are you scared I'm gonna ask you to come on? Thank you. So just so you know, it helps a pastor when I ask a question for you guys to go, yeah, just lie to me over on this section. All of you, yeah, we got cousins. Uh, you got good cousins. Yeah, we got good ones. You got bad ones. Everybody has some bad cousins. I don't, I don't know exactly which ones mine are. You're gonna see some cousins probably over Thanksgiving or Christmas. Jesus had a cousin, John the Baptist, and he said about his cousin, John is the best person ever born of a woman. Top notch, hard to do any better than John the Baptist, but John the Baptist was one of the last prophets and um, he just told the truth um, without any concern for the consequence. And in, there's really three passages of, of scripture where the story of John the Baptist is told. It's Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 14, and Luke chapter seven. And this illustrates the new covenant pretty well. John the Baptist saw an offense, a sin. Uh, Herod, the leader at the time, the, the Gentile leader at the time, had decided he was gonna marry his brother's wife uh, Herodias, it wasn't right, it wasn't legal. And John the Baptist, not as concerned that it was sin against God because he wouldn't expect non-Christians to act like Christians, but concerned that leaders obey the laws that they enforce with other people, expecting leaders, political leaders to be, um, you know, to be law abiding. He began to speak about it, saying, you know, Herod, you're breaking the law. Herod, you're breaking the law. Well, Herodias got really upset, the wife, and said, let's arrest John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin and one of his best friends. Let's throw him in a prison, three, I mean, way, way, way away from civilization, out in the desert. No meal program, no time in the yard, no work release. You didn't have friends there to feed you, you died, terrible place. And as soon as Jesus heard that John was arrested, Jesus did the unthinkable. He took off and he moved 200 miles away. 200 miles, Memphis to St. Louis, give or take. That's ah, a little further than that. How about us to Minneapolis? That's like 228, right? But we drive. It's the equivalent of you moving to Juneau, Alaska. It would take that long to walk there if we drove to Juneau. And John the Baptist languished in prison for over a year, waiting for Jesus to take care of his circumstances in life. Now, if he had been tempted to look back on the old way, he would have said, God has forgotten me. He's abandoned me. My life is not what I want it to be. And he began to waver a little bit. Doubt began to creep in because doubt creeps in. We've talked about that. Anybody ever struggle with doubt when circumstances get bad? It's okay to raise your hand. I got both hands up. It's natural. It's natural to say, if my life isn't what I want it to be, then God must not be who I want him to be or who he says he is. And so John the Baptist sent his friends who were there to keep him alive to go find Jesus and to ask the question. And I want you to read this on your own in Matthew chapter 11, 14 and Luke chapter seven to ask Jesus, are you really the one you said you were? Am I really spending my life Trusting someone who's trustworthy. Am I a fool? That's my paraphrase. And his friends went and found Jesus. And they saw Jesus healing and feeding and teaching everybody else. You ever been like that in your life? Where you need a miracle, you find yourself in prison in some way? Big problems, serious problems, and it seems like God's blessing everybody but you. 
And so John's disciples say, Jesus, John wants to know if you're the real deal. And Jesus says, just tell him the works that I've done. Go tell him the works that I've done, what, what you see me doing. And they're like, Jesus, that's not gonna go really well. Now, again, this is a paraphrase, but you read it, I know you'll draw the same conclusions because John's hurting and he's suffering and he wants you to free him from prison and vindicate his reputation to set wrong or right all that's wrong. And then Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 11, and I really encourage you again for the third time to look these up on your own. Jesus said, blessed are those whose faith doesn't stumble because of me. Jesus said that. Now, one of the ways we know the New Testament is God's word. One of the ways that people who decided what was true and what wasn't who made these decisions is because um, uh, there was a form of reading the literature where they knew that unless this was true, nobody would ever write something like this about somebody they loved, their hero, the hero of the story, Jesus, because it makes him look so bad. Just go tell John all the things I'm doing for other people. And by the way, blessed if you don't stumble on account of me. I mean, it just seems heartless. It seems so distant. And then as I begin to really study this, it's so much more powerful and personal and big picture than we could ever imagine. Blessed are those who don't leave the faith because I don't do the things that they think I should do. Back to Emory, two years old, loves asking for help. Bapo, she calls me Bapo. I didn't ask her to call me Bapo. She called me Bapo when she was little bitty and I, it just stuck. And so Bapo is my name. I don't know how to spell it. It's spelled different ways. You can pick away if you ever want to. She calls me Bapo and her favorite thing to do is to ask me for help. Bapo, help. And um, reach her hand up and she'll try to take me to help, have her help her do something. Now, let me tell you something about a two-year-old. Most of the stuff they want help with, you don't want to help them with because they're going to die. They're going to choke. They're going to fall. I mean, something bad's going to happen. I mean, Emery wants help doing the craziest things and, and she can't do them herself, but she wants me to help and she's two. And so when you say no, Emery, and you know, you don't just say no, Emery, grow up, want the right kind of things because she's two and you love her. You squat down with her and you put your arm around her and you're like, now, Emery, if we do this, this is not really going to be good for you. You don't want to go to the ER. Bapo doesn't want mama to be mad at me and never let me watch you again. You know, you put your arm around her and she goes, oh, okay, Bapo, I understand. You know what's best for me. And I'm just, no, she doesn't do that at all. She gives you the two-year-old stiff arm. Have you ever had one of those where you're like trying to hold them and they go Wah! like that and they like push you at a distance and then they start to scream, but there's no noise that comes out at first. And then the noise starts coming out after the, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Because you're not giving her what she wants. And I'm like, if I give you what I want, or what you want, I'm the worst grandparent ever. How mean, how bad would it be? How short-sighted would it be for me to give her everything she wants just because she's screaming for it? But I don't tell her to go to her room. I don't put her in exile. I don't tell her to grow up. I embrace her, put her on the chair with me. We turn frozen on, right? I tell her I love her. I'm not gonna do what you want me to do, but I'm gonna show you how much I love you because of this new covenant, I am with you. I will give you strength. I will give you perspective. I will lead you home. I will welcome you when you leave this life behind and you open your eyes to the reality of heaven and I look at you and say, well done. Blessed are you because you didn't let your faith crumble when I didn't do what you told me to do. And that is such a mature, difficult point that I'm taking you to. Because in reality, we just want good circumstances. We're human. And we constantly fight that battle. So let me tell you one of the prayers that God does or one of the promises that, that God does give us in this new covenant. One of my favorite verses to pray for people, maybe if you and I have shared, or shared text, texts or phone calls in times of need, maybe I've shared this with you. Because I can't pull 
random passages, particularly from the Old Testament, and slap spiritual truisms on things that are going on in your life, giving you the sense of guarantee that as long as you're doing what God wants you to do, everything in your life is going to be better. Because we're playing a long game and we live in a world where things happen. And by the way, bad things don't just happen to Christians, bad things happen to people. And Philip Yancey said, and I don't know which book this was, but that isn't it a whole lot better to deal with and go through the bad things in life, the disappointments in life with God, than to be mad at him because our life isn't what we want it to be and try to go through it without? I mean, you've gone through these things on your own with your own strength under your own power. And I know how much mess you've made of your life because I've done it in my life. And Jesus says, look, I may not give you what you think you want, but I'm gonna give you what you need. Come up here and let me be with you. And this is one of these promises, this new covenant promise that he guarantees. He says, don't be anxious about anything. And when I read that, I'm like, oh, right. Paul's telling me that God said this, and Jesus is gonna do this. Easy for Paul to say, but let me tell you something about Paul. Paul had some circumstance. You remember who Paul is? For those of you who aren't churchy, um, he wrote a bunch of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit inspired it, but Paul wrote it. He was a church planter. He was a pastor, a missionary. Before that, he was a vigilante who tried to kill anybody who was a Christian. Great story. The apostle Paul had something in his life that was wrong. He wanted gone, a circumstance. And he said, God, it's keeping me from being who you want me to be. I can't be fully present in my relationships. I'm in pain. And he said, take it away. And the Bible says that Jesus answered Paul and said, no. <laughs> now it's not no, grow, right? It's like, no, no. And then the second time Paul asks Jesus, he says, look, take it away. And Jesus answers and says, no. And so Paul, exasperated, says, Jesus, for the third time, take it away from me. Don't you see I'm in pain? And Jesus says, no. And Paul had to choose. He could have thrown up that two-year-old stiff arm and begin to scream with his face contorted before the words come out and stamp his foot and say, you're not the kind of God who I want to serve because you don't do what I tell you to do. But when Jesus said no, there was a comma, not a period. And he said, my grace is all you need in your life. My gracious favor is all you need because my strength you'll find in your weakness. And other people can see how strong I am when you show them how you deal with things in your life that you wish were different. Blessed are those whose faith doesn't crumble on account of Jesus not doing what you think he should. So don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God because he wants to hear them like any father, even if they're not the right requests. He wants to hear them. And sometimes he changes circumstances for the better. And sometimes he allows us like John the Baptist to languish in a prison, seeming to never show up. Sometimes you have Stephen who was stoned for preaching the gospel. Sometimes you have Paul and Silas who are in prison singing worship songs and an earthquake frees them from their chains. But this is about letting God be the God of the sometimes and us presenting our request to him. And then here's the promise, friends. This is the promise that you can take with you and apply with confidence. And the peace of God, which transcends, and that means goes above, beyond, blows the human mind. And the peace of God, God's peace. I pray this for you so often. I pray for my kids, for my wife, for my granddaughter, that you would have God's peace regardless of what's going on in the world, with or without Christ, you're gonna deal with. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which blows the human mind beyond what you can imagine or compare because you didn't cook it up and neither did any other human. It will stand guard over your hearts 
in Christ Jesus. God, here are my requests. Here's my pain. Here's my disappointment. I don't know how things are going to work out or if things are going to work out. This is what I want. And this is what I think I need. But you're God. And if you choose not to give me these things, I'm not going anywhere. Because your plan is better than my plan. And your purpose, even though I don't understand it, is my purpose. So what I have to have, God, is your peace inside my heart with Jesus Christ standing guard, not allowing anything to penetrate. And that condition of the soul blows the human mind because it gives us the power to endure and to overcome anything the world may throw at us. And it's all possible because of this new covenant, the new covenant that Jesus made with his blood. The new covenant is an agreement that God makes with us that if we confess our sins, Jesus forgives us our sins, that he cleanses us of unrighteousness, that he makes us his child, that his presence is guaranteed in our life because of an event, a person, the resurrection, ascension, of Jesus Christ and the fact that he is in charge of who we are and what we are. Now, that's a mouthful. It's a lot, but it's one of the most basic things we have to understand in our faith. And until we can get to that point, we never move past the two-year-old stage. A two-year-old's supposed to be a two-year-old. Do you know why? This is an easy question. Because they are... I bet some people online answered that faster than you did. A two-year-old's supposed to be two because they are? Gee whiz, people. One more time. Two, right? A two-year-old's supposed to be two because they are? All right, because they're two. Now, is a 25-year-old supposed to act like a two-year-old? Or a 40-year-old or a 54-year-old? But when Christians who should be growing, choose to act like spiritual two-year-olds. Nothing could be more tragic. So we celebrate this event. We celebrate this last supper because Jesus says, today's the day that everything changes. We do it in remembrance of him because of him, with gratitude for the new arrangement, that he fulfilled the old agreement, completed it. And it's not a slightly different covenant with us. It's an entirely different way of living. And that's why we get together and do what we're doing today. I'm going to pray for you. And during these next couple of songs that we're singing together, I'm going to ask my friends to come down if you're part of our prayer team. And they're just going to be here in the front. If you have a need, if you have a burden you're carrying, if something for yourself or maybe for someone else, because oftentimes the burdens we carry for other people are, they weigh us down. They're heavier than the ones that we even deal with ourselves. If there's something that you want someone else just to pray with you about or for you, I just want to invite you after we begin singing, everyone's going to stand and we'll have some friends up here in the front. You can just make your way to the front. Just grab one of them and you'll kind of peel off to a side there and just share with them what's going on. These are folks who I would love to pray with me and ask to pray for me uh, on Sunday mornings and also when things are going on in my life. And um, I just want you to take advantage of that because we are here for each other. So first service, I forgot to end the story with John the Baptist. I had some folks come up and they're like, hey, what happened with him? Because I know that, um, you know, not everybody grew up in church like like, um, I did and some of you did. And and if you don't know, you don't know. You're not supposed to know. It's not good um, what happened to John the Baptist. As a matter of fact, um, the plot even continued to thicken. It was a weird, incestuous, kind of dysfunctional home that Herod ran. And he had friends that were just as weird. And um, he just decided one day at a party, he wanted his niece to dance for him. And I don't mean dance like in ballet way, I mean dance like in a, in a way way. And um, made a deal that, um, you know, if he got what he wanted, that uh, his wife basically would get John the Baptist's head on a platter. And um, unfortunately, 
that's what happened to John. And it seems like the story would be over at that point, right? Because you're like, good man died badly. Leaves you kind of unsatisfied. What's the point? Um, in a way, it was almost foreshadowing of another good man, a perfect man, dying badly, not deserving it. Only this man was without sin. And John the Baptist, even though he was a good one, still was born sinful. The worst possible thing happened to the best possible person. And one of the lessons, as we've already discussed, that we learn through this is that this life is not the life that we're counting on. These circumstances are not the circumstances that determine the status and the state of our soul, of our hope, of our faith. That we as Christians are lifted above the circumstance in the world, but driven toward the reality of the kingdom of God that's yet to come. And Jesus died on the cross after being tortured and falsely accused, dying the worst possible death and being literally dead and entombed and then rose again. And there was a reason that he had to die. And the reason is, is that we were all born sinful, just like John the Baptist. And every person from the time of Adam and Eve until today and on until Jesus comes again, who is born, will be born sinful. Even my little granddaughter, Emery, sometimes especially, right? And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That what we have coming to us for being sinful is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. But Jesus had to die in our place so that we didn't have to, so that spiritual death never happens to us. So even though John lost his head, he spent eternity, is spending eternity with Jesus in heaven, celebrating a life well lived and a race that he won. So when we celebrate communion, when we participate in communion, we are remembering an event. It's a historic event, the event where Jesus died on the cross and rose again. But it's also a very personal event where you and I made that historic event personal to us. And it was almost transactional where you and I had to decide that we were going to take us, ourselves, everything we know about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that we give it to everything we know about Jesus and we say, I want you to forgive me of my sin, the thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to you, but I need you to forgive me from my sin, the sin that the just reward is me spending eternity in, in, in hell, separation from you, forgive me for this. I believe who Jesus is, even though I don't know everything, what I know I believe, and I wanna follow you with my life. I wanna live in this new agreement, this new covenant. And for us, when we make that decision, everything changes. Well, coming back to this table is in a way us and our spirit going back to that time when we prayed to receive Jesus in the first place, where you don't have anything held back from him. No fine print and your contract. No sticky notes hidden away with stuff that you wanna keep and hang on to that he can't see everything you know about you to everything you know about him. Even though there's a little uncertainty there and uncertainty makes us a little nervous. Well, coming back to the table today, there'll be a time for us to examine our hearts to see if perhaps there's any ground we've taken back, any fine print we've written into the contract, any nooks, crannies, or cupboards that maybe we have stashed away sin in that we don't really wanna to give to God. And there'll be a time for you to think about that, to ask God to reveal that to you. And King David, he says, some things are known to me and I gotta confess them and also show me those things that are hidden within me, that lurk within me. And it was a prayer of his, it can certainly be a prayer of ours. We confess. We also remember and remember well and we celebrate and we say thank you. 
So as Jesus sat with his disciples at this last Passover, at this Lord's Supper, he said these words, or these words were recorded about the time, and he told them, there's a new decision, a new covenant, a new agreement, and it's going to be symbolized by two things, bread and wine, for us a cracker and juice. And the disciples that night, they were eating the bread and drinking the wine and learning about what this is going to look like even a couple days before this event, this historic and yet personal event happened. But you and I, even though we're many years removed from that last supper, we eat the cracker and drink the juice, remembering the event, the historic and personal event that surely happened. And Jesus encouraged and commanded them that when they do it, to do it often. Because he knew that we live in a world where we slip that we have within us a selfishness that can consume, a distraction and a preoccupation with things of this life that pull us away from the people of God, the things of God, the priorities of God. And it's just a time to recalibrate, almost like renewing your vows of a wedding ceremony, where you come back and you say, I would do it all over again today, just like I did X number of years ago. And it's a beautiful time and it's an important time and it's a time that we celebrate and participate in as a family. So this is what's gonna happen. In just a couple minutes, there's gonna be an instrumental background piece and some slides on the screen with some scripture that I hope will help you focus your thought. I wanna encourage you to ask God to reveal in you any sin, anything that may be in you, thoughts, actions, and especially attitudes, because those are the ones that get us Christians so fast that are displeasing to the Lord. And when he points them out, then you give them to him. Oh, you're right, God, there it is. Forgive me of that. I don't want that in me anymore. Go through this process, just you and God. You're taking your heart back just like it was that first time. And then after you do that, then I just want to encourage you to thank him. To thank him for making all of it possible, for choosing you, for dying on the cross, to pay the price of your sin, of my sins. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. And we thank him. And then after this, this instrumental piece is over, Ashley's going to give you instructions and she's going to say very simply, when you're ready and if you're ready, then come to one of these aisles and walk to the front and we'll have some SLT and deacons here and they will give you these elements of remembrance. You don't have to be a member of Capital City Church to participate in the Lord's Supper, just a member of the family of God, a person who has given themselves to Jesus and trusted him as their Lord and Savior. And you come and you participate. You can linger here at the front if you want to and pray. You can go back to your seats as a family if you're by yourself or with a friend. Um, there'll be no further instructions given. When you eat the cracker, it's in remembrance of the body that Jesus gave up for us. When you drink the juice, it's in remembrance of the blood that he shed for us, this sacrifice. Ashley and the band will be singing a song during that time, and then I'll come up and I'll close this. But right now I'm gonna pray, and I just wanna invite you to take just a few minutes to get alone with God and examine your heart. Father, thank you so much for the time that we have spent and the time we're going to spend, the most important part. And I pray that as we get alone with you for just a few minutes, that you would Take the flashlight of your Holy Spirit and examine the nooks and the crannies, the dark places in our, in our hearts, our lives. That you would reveal to us anything you don't want there. That you would free us from the sin that entangles, that ensnares, that burdens. That we would be honest with you. That we would turn our hearts of confession toward hearts of thanksgiving particularly in this Thanksgiving season, thanking you for the greatest gift that could ever be given and the reality of your presence in our lives, regardless of circumstance, because of Jesus' sacrifice. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.